Hi everyone, this is Dr. Andrew Hammond. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, thank you for inviting me to your conference. I really wish I could be there with you, unfortunately, with the state of the pandemic. Uh, like most medical conferences, we'll have to be doing this uh, virtually. My job is to cover a variety of aspects of immune dysfunction, primarily related to the innate immune response. And so I'll be with you throughout many of the hours of lecture over the course of the next two days uh, to ensure that you understand both basic aspects of immune function as well as, a, as it relates to a variety of uh, uh, disease states and conditions specifically related to the, need, the innate immune system or what we call biotoxin illnesses. Um, as a way of introduction, uh, I'm a family physician by training, and I hold several educational and academic hats. The first is I'm the medical director of integrative medicine at the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. And in addition to that, I'm the director of academic affairs for the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. My clinical and research expertise is in biotoxin illness. Uh, we've been collecting data and publishing studies, including a whole medical textbook called The Art and Science of SIRS that we published uh, this past September 2020, uh, describing a lot of aspects of what I'll be covering uh, over the course of the coming uh, lectures. Uh, in this particular talk, I will just be discussing the basics of the immune response, uh, what I call Immunology 101. So we'll look at the components of the immune system, as well as analyze various types of immune dysfunction and discuss the role of the resolution of how the immune system essentially turns off inflammation. And finally, we'll begin to investigate some aspects of the genomics related to immune activation and lack of regulation. So what are some of the aspects of a properly functioning immune system? Well, it needs to surveil the landscape and understand what's a threat and what's not a threat. It needs to be internally regulated so that once the inflammatory response is ignited, that it doesn't run out of control. So there has to be compensatory mechanisms and countermeasures to ensure that it's regulated. In addition to that, we want it to be tolerant to our own tissues and cells, as well as to foreign antigens that are not a threat. And finally, uh, we now understand more about how this whole process turns off or resolves over time. This is sort of a new finding. We didn't fully appreciate the degree to which the immune system is able to, in a very purposeful way, return back to a baseline set of activity. And then finally, we know that once inflammation uh, begins, there can be some side effects to that, uh, unintended consequences in terms of tissue destruction, uh, destruction and scarification um, and wounds and ongoing uh, irritation to the tissue. So how do we repair that? Well, it turns out the immune system itself has a variety of cells and mechanisms uh, to, to restore normal tissue integrity and initiate the healing response. So going a level deeper, what surveillance? What, what does this mean in terms of the immune system's ability to detect uh, threats vis-a-vis uh, -vis molecular structures? And there's really kind of two broad categories. The first, are, first is PAMPs, which are pathogen-associated molecular patterns. These are foreign molecules not associated with human cells and are basically uh, epitopes or proteins that are found on organisms. And so this notion of the immune system's capacity to detect a, you know, literally thousands and thousands of these, uh, broadly speaking, is incredibly uh, impressive. In addition to that, there's a second category of what the immune system is able to respond to, and these are called danger-associated molecular patterns, or DAMPs. And these are unique molecules that are on a variety of uh, all sorts of other stressors, uh, stressors and threats. And this notion that the immune system has an incredibly broad ability uh, to determine uh, what might be a threat is sort of part and parcel, especially to the early action of the innate immune response. So this is an important component of um, how we stay safe in environments that might have, uh, you know, th threats to us and threats to our immune system. Uh, but of course, it has to be broad in that regard. In addition to that, once the system, uh, you know, begins to determine what's a threat, we also want to have tolerance, which is the other side of the coin. It's what's not a threat. How do we determine self from not self. And this really begins uh, with early fetal uh, development in terms of uh, being able to train the immune system in this regard, to develop immune tolerance, which is established, 
And also over time, we know that it can fail in both broad and specific ways, uh, whether or not these are two uh, antigens which are not threatening, uh, or we can have a response by interacting families or subsets of cells that include antigen presenting cells, T, uh, T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes, messenger molecules, cytokines, chemokines, and their receptors, as well as signaling and co-stimulating molecules on cell surfaces. So this notion that there's a variety of ways in which uh, the immune system makes mistakes, essentially, and either uh, believes a certain, quote, foreign protein, meaning antigen is a threat, and or uh, it detects uh, a, a portion of our cellular structure or tissues uh, that appears to be a threat as well. Uh, so we don't want mistakes, but it can make mistakes. This is where, uh, you know, for example, autoimmune diseases arise or inappropriate uh, inflammatory responses are, are generated. And then finally, resolution, this notion that, you know, the immune system has the ability to return to a normal state of affairs. And it's not just catabolism of, you know, the inflammatory mediators, um, but instead, there truly is a set of coordinated events uh, that uh, stimulate this pro-resolving program aimed at restoration of tissue homeostasis, integrity, and function. Uh, this mostly has to do uh, with macrophages in particular and their ability to basically uh, shift their phenotype from a M1 pro-inflammatory state to an M2 anti-inflammatory state that becomes sort of the cleanup crew in that regard. And then finally, restoration. This notion that the immune system can uh, repair damage that ensues because of this reaction to even, you know, properly detected PAMPs and DAMPs and other foreign threats. So we have a specialized set of cells that clean up the debris, help heal and repair and rebuild tissues such as phagocytes and fibroblasts and stem cells and uh, endothelial cells. So here's the organization of the immune response. And I would really uh, suggest that you would try and commit at least components of this to memory if you haven't already, that there are these two broad arms, including the innate and the adaptive immune system, and this notion that each side is organized based on its activities and a variety of cells that are unique to each. So we see neutrophils and monocytes or macrophages, including microglial cells in the brain uh, that are all part and parcel, as well as natural killer cells in the complement system that are involved in that coordinated innate immune response. But eventually there's the handoff uh, to the adaptive immune system, uh, which is cell mediated and uh, humoral immunity. This is basically T cells and B cells. Uh, and natural killer cells, then over time, uh, the cleanup crew begins to emerge, which is the other side uh, of that immune response, as we talked about, the repair side. Um, so uh, it's important to kind of keep all of these in mind because each side has its own role and responsibility, and both are coordinated. Uh, the bridge is the antigen presenting cell, and that's a very important uh, point of discussion that we're going to review. So here's how uh, each of these cells begin to develop uh, from a pluripotent stem cell, either down the myeloid stem cell line into the innate immune cells or up the lymphoid stem cell line into T cells and B cells and natural killer cells. So what's inflammation? Inflammation traditionally is defined by the four Latin words, calor, dolor, rubor, and tumor, meaning heat, pain, redness, and so on. We know this. This is, you know, all of us learned uh, what these are in the very early stages of our uh, healthcare training. And it's an attempt by the body to restore and maintain homeostasis after injury, which is an integral part of the body's defense. It's essentially beneficial, but either prolonged inflammation or excess inflammation can cause harm to us. And that's outside of a uh, e either, uh, you know, a process where there's loss of tolerance, but instead what we're really talking about is lack of regulation, and that can occur where there's a persistence of the immune response for various reasons that put ourselves at risk over time. So there are different stages of the inflammatory response, and we know that within the first minutes to hours, 
there's the early part of uh, inflammatory activity. So a stimuli such as an injury or an infection triggers the release of a variety of mediators such as leukotrienes and prostaglandins and histamines all within seconds to minutes. And we start to see the redness and swelling and pain uh, that are part and parcel to this inf early inflammatory process. And uh, binding of these mediators to the receptors on endothelial cells cause, causes the vasodilation contraction of endothelial cells and increased blood vessel uh, permeability so we get leakage but it allows trafficking of immune cells from within the cardiovascular system out into the periphery uh, we as a result notice that the basement membrane surrounding these capillaries become rearranged to promote the migration of these leukocytes and the movement from plasma uh, and through the capillaries into the surrounding tissue also there's this notion of mast cells uh, in the connective tissue as ways as basophils and neutrophils and platelets and some of you probably have you know caught on to some of the interest in mast cell activation um, I'll, I'll talk about that too in terms of an excess histamine response and sort of what our research has shown maybe as a counterbalance to this notion of maybe overly blaming mast cells in in patients who have some histamine related issues in addition to that there's late inflammation which occurs within two to four hours uh, of the uh, early stages of, of the inflammatory response. Here we activate our macrophages and vascular endothelial cells to release cytokines such as TNF-alpha and IL-1 uh, and uh, when their toll-like receptors bind to the PAMPs. Uh, this enables the vascular endothelial cells of nearby venules to increase their expression of adhesion molecules, P-selectins and E-selectins, intracellular adhesion molecules, ICAMs, and chemokines, which are basically controlling factors uh, to help regulate that immune uh, response. What's really important here is that after the early stages of neutrophil sort of marching into an area to release early stages of inflammation and begin that process uh, of pain and swelling and leaking of uh, blood vessels, then the large eaters, the macrophages, arrive on the scene of the crime and they've transformed themselves into that M1 pro-inflammatory state through a variety of genomic mechanisms, and they become sort of the thugs of the immune system. Uh, there's a reason why they're called large eaters, and that is because they're so good uh, at uh, dealing with foreign invaders. Uh, but of course, they produce uh, a robust amount of inflammatory proteins uh, that over time potentially can uh, damage the tissue. So this innate immune response happens very quickly. It's broad. Uh, to a variety of immune threats, but it's only capable to a certain degree of stopping pathogens from entering and spreading in the body. Uh, this is why there are different layers or, or um, elements of the innate immune response, including physical components like the skin and mucous membranes that form these external barriers, but also a variety of different cells, which are called leukocytes or white blood cells, which are the neutrophils, uh, these are the foot soldiers, the macrophages, the large, uh, large eaters, natural killer cells, which are a little more specialized, and then various substances in the blood and the body fluid, like the complement system. This notion of the innate immune response isn't necessarily new. And, you know, it was first sort of recognized, at least in the 1970s, when we were talking about this, quote, peculiar reaction of the host to toxins. Uh, and this notion that um, there was this early response that didn't seem to include the more sophisticated T cells and B cells. Um, and over time, uh, the literature has just grown, and there are tens of thousands of research studies on the innate immune response and inappropriateness of that uh, within a disease context. Um, so by 2011, the Nobel Prize was awarded for some of the early work uh, in the innate immune response. Uh, it's typically activated both by PAMPs and DAMPs, but also trauma. So whether that's mechanical, chemical, heat, or UV light, uh, there's a variety of ways of sort of turning on these cells and activating this early inflammatory process. So the neutrophils are the body's first line of defense against these foreign uh, invaders and constitute the major cell type. Uh, in both acute and some forms of chronic inflammation. They're the most prevalent leukocyte in the bloodstream, uh, consisting of at least 50% of those white blood cells. Uh, and they're considered surveillance cells that kind of sweep through the tissues and uh, utilize some general mechanisms to determine PAMPs and DAMPs. But unfortunately, the capacity of the neutrophils to destroy foreign organisms uh, may also uh, 
uh, be overweighed by their capacity to destroy the localized tissue. Uh, so this gets into that unregulated immune response. In addition to that, uh, macrophages are the big eaters. So as I said, we have these sort of different versions or various types of macrophages. Uh, there are the M1 type and the M2 type. And the M1 type uh, is uh, the one that's pro-inflammatory. It's one phenotypic expression of macrophage uh, uh, physicality and activity. And then they're able to transition to the M2 phenotype, which is really part of the cleanup crew. So macrophages are designed to follow behind neutrophils and deal with the debris that's created as a result of that early uh, immune response. They reside in every tissue in the body, including the brain, which we call microglial cells. And they engulf apoptotic cells and pathogens and produce immune effector cells. Um, so these microglial cells and macrophages are found uh, everywhere. In addition to that, we have the complement system, which is comprised of these soluble substances uh, that support the defense uh, uh, cells of the innate immune system. And there are nine different types of enzymes that are sort of activated in a cascade. I'll be talking about the complement system later, especially the alternate cascade. So there's actually some alternate, alternate proteins uh, that are also produced, especially in biotoxin-related illness that aren't normally measured, but they're incredibly helpful uh, blood markers for us. Uh, they're able to mark pathogens uh, to attract other leukocytes. Uh, they also are able to dissolve the cell walls of bacteria uh, to uh, deactivate them, and they are capable of fighting viruses uh, directly or indirectly as well. In addition to that, the sort of um, the actual components of that inflammatory process are often characterized by the release of cytokines. These are low molecular weight uh, soluble proteins uh, that are produced in response to an antigen and function as chemical messengers for regulating the innate and adaptive immune system. Uh, uh, those are typically also termed as chemokines, which is kind of a subset. They're produced by virtually every cell in the innate and adaptive side of the immune system, but especially by T helper cells, which are, um, you know, a class of uh, T cells on the adaptive side of the immune system that support the immune response and help to regulate it or push that immune response into sort of one position or another. Uh, they also offer the ability to regulate um, the immune, the innate and adaptive immune systems. So the cytokines not don't just have the ability to produce inflammation, but they have other function as well, and they even stimulate hematopoiesis. So we can see there's a variety of uh, cytokines that are released on both the innate and the adaptive side uh, of the immune system. There are many, many, many uh, different types of cytokines, and they're characterized mostly by their function as well as by which cells release it. But one cytokine can be released uh, by a variety of different uh, immune-related cells. Um, I think really importantly is this notion of an antigen-presenting cell, which is a specialized monocyte. And uh, this is really uh, the bridge between the innate and adaptive immune system. Uh, they're designed uh, to sort of upregulate at the induct uh, to induce an adaptive immune response when a pathogen or an antigen is ingested by a monocyte. And then um, what happens is that um, monocyte or specialized phagocytic cell is able to sort of degrade that antigen and um, take a piece of a protein that we call an epitope and present it to a T cell. This is really important because this is how the innate immune system communicates and turns on the adaptive immune response. So there's this bridge between the early reactions of neutrophils and macrophages, but eventually the antigen presenting cells arrive at the scene of the crime and they start to look for uh, the antigen itself and then ingest it or ingest a component of it and take a snippet of it to present to a T cell. And the snippet is supposed to be a unique component of the antigen. This notion that antigen presenting cells have that ability is, is quite fabulous. And it's able to then uh, turn on a more specific adaptive immune response, which begins with the activation of a T cell uh, receptor. And I'm going to talk about that more in some of the transcriptomic research that we do.
Now, we often talk about leaky gut in our field. And I don't think we uh, maybe fully appreciate that it's a model for everything that I just talked about. When you have breakdown in the basement membrane or uh, partially digested food that presents as uh, dietary peptides and uh, proteins that maybe in their form shouldn't be crossing the basement membrane, or uh, this notion that the immune system has learned to respond inappropriately uh, to proteins in ways that uh, uh, maybe it shouldn't, that you know we're developing inflammatory responses to relatively innocuous items in our diet. The breakdown, of course, in the gut uh, and the predisposition towards gut permeability uh, comes from a variety of factors. So it's stress and various medications and uh, exposures and toxins, uh, dysbiosis. Uh, there's a variety of things, of course, that break down the gut, alter the milieu, and predispose us to these uh, peptides and proteins that are able to cross into uh, the interior of the body. And so we have this sort of early immune response uh, that we know begins to occur along the gut lining, because this is where 70 to 80% of the immune system is, is located. But beyond that, we know antigen presenting cells surveil or traffic all along the gut. And they're looking for the presence of these peptides that are crossing through the tight junctions and across the basement membrane. Uh, and they'll engulf them, break them down, uh, and then present the epitope, um, the portion of a protein to a T cell. This bridge, that, which I've encircled here, is so critical to the coordination of the innate immune response with the adaptive immune system. And there are problems that can occur with the antigen presenting cell, and those problems uh, can be inherited uh, or they can be acquired. In the context of a biotoxin illness, we believe about 20% of the population inherits HLA alleles on chromosome 6 that confer inefficiency with the antigen presenting cells. What that means then is as the immune system is upregulating and turning on this innate immune response and inflammation is building, if there isn't an, a, an efficient transition to the adaptive side of the immune system, because those HLA alleles are present and these APCs are inefficient, the body can have unregulated inflammation. It stays essentially stuck on the uh, innate immune side of the equation. And then once that occurs, if it occurs properly, we see induction of uh, T cells and T helper cells, as well as killer T cells, and then B cells, uh, which are, uh, you know, those components of the adaptive immune system that starts to produce targeted antibodies. Now, of course, unfortunately, we can see that some of this activity in turn, because it's localized inflammation, begins to destroy the gut lining itself and potentially further worse in the permeability. Uh, but also we know that once this process occurs locally, it can establish more broadly as well a systemic inflammatory response. And it's been linked to a variety of different uh, chronic illnesses, mostly all immune mediated. So the adaptive immune system uh, is designed to be the backstop to an innate immune response that's essentially been unsuccessful in destroying pathogens. And it upregulates about four to seven days um, after the uh, um, uh, innate immune response has been doing its job. And it's meant to be much more specific in its ability to target uh, anti uh, antigens. And so the adaptive defense takes longer, but it targets these pathogens and antigens uh, more accurately. The other advantage is it can remember the aggressor and act specifically against certain antigens uh, because it contains memory cells. So it can upregulate quite quickly if it sees the same antigen again. Uh, there are several parts uh, that react in different ways depending on the place in the body where the antigen or pathogen is located. Again, the components of the adaptive immune response are T cells and B cells, the antibodies that the B cells produce, as well as, again, cytokines that both act as inflammatory proteins, but also messenger-like molecules that we call chemokines. We also have these terms to distinguish between B cells and T cells. So we call B cell activity humoral immunity. So this is where those antibodies are produced and made available for germs outside the cell. Um, and in addition to that, cell-mediated immunity, the, the hint is in the name, 
eliminates pathogens that are inside the tissue and inside cells. So T cells are better suited for viruses and certain parasites, and B cells are potentially better suited for other types of antigens and bacteria that don't enter the cells themselves. So cell-mediated immunity, these T cells are responsible for special defense of the tissue, uh, which is carried out by cells. They recognize infected cells and are responsible for their destruction and elimination from the body. And we have a variety of different types of T cells. We have CD4 T cells along with CD8, which make up the majority of T lymphocytes. Those CD4 cells differentiate into distinct effector subtypes, which play a major role in mediating immune response through secretion of specific cytokines. And they carry out multiple functions ranging from activation of cells related to the immune system and B cells and cytotoxic T cells, as well as a non-immune mediated response, which plays a critical role in actually turning off uh, the immune system. So what are those CD4 cells that I mentioned? These T helper cells, and I've said this a couple times now. Well, there's a variety of different types of T helper cells. Uh, T helper cell uh, type 1 participate in both cell-mediated and antibody-mediated immunity. They're essential for controlling uh, intracellular pathogens such as viruses and some bacteria. They provide cytokine-mediated help to cytotoxic T lymphocytes, perhaps the body's most potent weapon against intracellular pathogens, and they're associated with organ-specific autoimmune diseases. So Th1, when you step back, and this is a little old school, but Th1 uh, it tends to participate or upregulate in the setting of um, inflammatory responses that include autoimmune processes uh, as well as oncologic processes. Th2, on the other hand, are associated with and provide help for B cells, and um, particularly the production of IgE mediated antibody responses. So think atopic illnesses asthma, allergies, eczema. There's also uh, uh, TFH cells, which are follicular helper cells. Now, these provide support for B cells, and they're the most abundant type of T helper cell that's out there. And then there are newer ones, TH17, TH22, uh, and the rest. Uh, some of our work focuses on TH17 cells and their ability to produce uh, transforming growth factor beta 1 and help to regulate uh, T, uh, T reg cells too. So B cells, on the other hand, this is responsible for humoral immunity, which means production of antibodies. And we all learned a long time ago that there are a variety of these antibodies, which are, you know, soluble proteins that are present in the blood and measurable that are supposed to indicate something about the activity of the adaptive immune system, IgG, IgM, IgA, IgD and IgE. Uh, IgG, uh, we, we think of this as either, you know, um, a, a chronic response or a uh, prior uh, threat or infection. IgM is meant to be a reaction to something that we believe is current. IgA is typically expressed along the mucosal membranes. IgD, we're, we're not sure what that is. And then IgE is involved in allergy. And so this notion that we have an organized uh, B cell mediated response to extracellular threats, uh, which is distributed throughout all the tissues in the body uh, and, and quite organized in that regard, uh, is, uh, you know, part of that adaptive immune response that acts in coordination to the cell mediated immunity of the T helper cells. But unfortunately, we can have loss of immune tolerance where the immune system begins to attack our own tissue and it's the known of loss of self tolerance. And this notion of tolerance may be induced in all lymphocyte populations. There really can be mistakes anywhere uh, from uh, T cells and B cells, uh, as well as even within the innate immune system. The CD4 T cell self tolerance is most important, occurs at a far lower antigen threshold than that for B and CD8 cells. There are different levels that are thought to occur in terms of loss of tolerance. They're basically models for how this, uh, uh, essentially call it autoimmunity occurs or loss of tolerance and um, uh, inappropriate responses. So there's the upper level of central tolerance, which develops primarily in fetal life. And then there's the lower level of peripheral tolerance, which develops postnatally as a backup process. 
and this faulty central tolerance sows the seeds for autoimmune diseases, um, while faulty peripheral tolerance leads to uh, an inflammatory uh, eruption. And uh, this also gets into sort of other models, um, and there's sort of the, uh, the the other kind of competing idea, which has to do with breakdown of basement membranes followed by molecular mimicry. So this notion that uh, foreign antigens can cross, of course, into the interior of the body uh, because of uh, loss of protection, either along the gut lining or the endothelial lining of the uh, vascular system or the blood brain barrier. So that sort of is a central feature of loss of tolerance. But then we also uh, have this notion of molecular mimicry and this this idea that um, uh, there can be an inappropriate response to our own tissue because the the immune system has learned to react to certain antigens and it might ap uh, appear to the immune system that some of our own proteins and cell structures look like that other foreign antigen. This is called molecular mimicry. So the establishment first of a, an immune response against an antigen and then molecular mimicry, meaning that the immune system is starting to make mistakes. And we have a variety of autoimmune diseases that are included in this notion of um, you know, loss of tolerance. And it really just depends on the tissue type. So to the thyroid or to the connective tissue um, or to the uh, coating of the nerves or receptors uh, like insulin or uh, structures uh, within the biliary tree um, or acetylcholine receptors. So this notion uh, that the immune system can make all sorts of mistakes and be very specific about what it's learned to react to. Now, make no mistake, you know, once inflammation starts, whether it's in the gut or elsewhere because of invader, the brain senses this. You know, the brain is always looking for uh, activation of the immune response. Uh, this is typically generated through feedback loops within the immune system directly, but also the nervous system. And we see an upregulation of those specialized macrophages in the brain called microglial cells. There's also astrocytes. Uh, so we tend to have a brain and a body on fire. Now, in turn, the brain starts to send signals out uh, to try and regulate the immune response. And it can do that directly through the nervous system or also the endocrine system. You know, we don't normally think about the role that cortisol and reproductive hormones and thyroid might play in helping to mature and regulate the immune response, but it absolutely does. And I think in particular, one of the most important aspects of this, and I have a whole lecture on it that we're going to review, is the role of cortisol. You know, we, we, you know, the notion that glucocorticoids are, quote, anti-inflammatory, we know this because of medications like prednisone. You know, it was meant to be an analog to show that when cortisol levels go up, we're able to suppress the immune response. There's an alteration there as well, but generally speaking, cortisol is one of our most potent anti-inflammatory hormones. With that being said, um, when cortisol goes up, we can see changes in areas of the brain because it's a catabolic hormone. Uh, we have cortisol receptors that uh, concentrate in certain structures like the hippocampus, uh, the hypothalamus, the prefrontal cortex, and the amygdala. When there's an injury that happens to areas of the brain as a result of stress, uh, the brain essentially says enough is enough, and it will alter cortisol production. Now, we've been able to verify this through functional and structural MRIs. I see this in my work because I run structural MRIs in my patients. As a result of either functional or structural damage to the hippocampus and other areas of the brain, the brain responds by turning down the HPA axis. So what happens then is we lose that counter-regulatory control on the immune system. So this is where we get into sort of the systems biology approach that once the immune system is, is activated, we have counter-regulation through cortisol and other, uh, other uh, 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 countermeasures of our physiology. But conversely, you know, we can see situations where if we have an alteration of the HPA axis, it can liberate the immune system and cause a prolonged inflammatory response. And again, one of the most important is when we see changes in the stress axis. We also know that cortisol uh, 
imparts a certain sort of specific regulation on the immune system. So when cortisol levels are high, we tend to be we tend to be Th2 dominant. And when cortisol levels are low, we tend to be Th1 dominant. Now remember, these are T helper cells, and we talked about this. These are specialized CD4 cells within the adaptive immune system that confer certain predispositions within the immune response. So depending on the state of the HPA axis, we can push patients into one type of immune predisposition or another, and that loss of negative feedback from cortisol results in the dominance of one side of the immune system or the other. Again, another way that we might trigger neuroexcitation and neuroinflammation can happen in the gut. And so this gets into the gut-brain immune connection, and this is mediated through specialized enzymes in the gut that concentrate in the liver and the digestive tract called indolamines, or IDO for short. So what happens is when we have psychological or physical stressors, especially within the digestive tract, we see an upregulation of the indolamine enzyme. What that does is it begins to uh, metabolize or uh, uh, catabolize tryptophan uh, away from the serotonin pathway. So we have serotonin degradation as a result of upregulated indolamines. Now tryptophan that then goes down the kynurenine pathway and often preferentially produces quinolinates or quinolinic acid. And by virtue of that, there's this neurodegeneration, which in turn stimulates neuroexcitation and inflammation. So we have a brain on fire as a result of excess quinoline, quinolinate production in the gut. And this is uh, what we believe leads to one form of uh, depression. And this notion that a brain on fire, which can be instigated by a problem in the gut, is at least in part mediated through the indolamine pathway. So uh, again, another regulatory system that interfaces with the immune response, and it's worth pointing out from a clinical perspective that if you have an unregulated immune response, uh, it, it, and it's not just a reaction to food that causes generalized aches and pains, it can specifically lead to overproduction of quinolinic acid, which turns on inflammation in the brain. So I like to kind of begin to put things in a context for you because the body is a system of systems. And I'll be saying that over and over throughout my lectures. And it's really important to understand that we don't ever take just one marker. We don't take one symptom. We look for patterns that good practitioners are good at pattern recognition. And that's because the body organizes itself as a system of systems and counter-regulatory controls that when there's a pressure or a threat, there's a variety of responses that occur in coordination. And this coordinated response is meant to uh, help resist those pressures. But we can also have loss of resistance, so loss of resiliency. And when we see loss of resiliency, that usually occurs uh, within a subsystem. And I think of gut immune brain as a subsystem. I think a modifier uh, is the stress response. All of these things are connected, and we can't take them out of a certain context in, in that regard. We also see this uh, within the heart-brain connection, wh uh, which is um, you know, mediated through the autonomic nervous system. So how we think and feel and how we manage our stress begins to alter uh, the balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic response. And this notion that as we go into sympathetic overdrive, the heart rate speeds up. But it also is an indicator, therefore, of uh, not just sympathetic tone that might be inappropriate and prolonged, but when the sympathetic nervous system is inappropriately turned on, we know that there are receptors for those excitatory uh, neurotransmitters on immune cells. So the baseline levels of CRP and inflammation in general starts to go up. So one signal that this is occurring is through elevated heart rate. And then there's this corollary term called heart rate variability. So this notion that uh, the immune system is connected to the sympathetic nervous system uh, is incredibly important to understand.
And uh, one way to detect or identify a proxy measure for baseline inflammation is that elevated baseline heart rate uh, or loss of heart rate variability, which is very simply um, the, the recognition that when we're uh, relaxed and under a good parasympathetic tone, there's a bit of variation in timing between beats. And that little bit of chaos is actually measurable. We also know that as we become stressed and the sympathetic nervous system dominates, the heart not only beats faster, but in a more predictable fashion, we lose some of that variability and it starts to beat like a metronome. So we can measure heart rate variability as a proxy measure for systemic inflammation. And we know in turn that when we lose heart rate variability vis-a-vis -vis chronic inflammation, there's a variety of illnesses that are associated with that. Mental health issues, uh, chronic uh, inflammatory conditions such as arthritis and digestive problems and aches and pains and so on and so forth. The list really goes on and on. So, um, you know, this, again, a system of systems uh, that I think is important to understand and in the center of it or sort of one that's influenced deeply is our immune response. So this is a model of that, that we can have a, uh, a stressful event or ongoing depression or even medications, uh, all sorts of things affect, quote, vagal tone. And as a result, we see decreased heart rate variability and in turn, increased systemic inflammation. We know that among other things, this has been linked to cardiovascular disease. So patients who are under prolonged loss of heart rate variability are at significant increased risk for ischemic events, heart failure, and even death. This is a very robust marker in that regard. Not to mention that, you know, the stress could be affecting the gut and increasing endolamine response, further activating the immune system and uh, causing quinolinates and other inflammatory compounds to be produced. Uh, so all these things are sort of connected once you understand the baseline of activity. But how do you turn some of this off? Well, we never really knew that the immune system had the ability to resolve inflammation, but it does. And it turns out that under normal conditions, neutrophils undergo apoptosis. Basically, they have a expiration date and they go through the process of dying through certain stages of intracellular cell signaling activities um, after performing their action at the inflamed site. And macrophages then arrive on the scene in their M2 phenotype to ingest these apoptotic neutrophils. So the clearance of this debris essentially occurs because of this switch from the pro-inflammatory M1 type of macrophage to an anti-inflammatory M2 macrophage. And this active phenomenon of switching from M1 to M2, uh, which is aimed at actively suppressing and extinguishing a vibrant inflammatory reaction, is very purposeful. And it turns out that the way the switching occurs is the presence through what are called uh, pro-resolvin mediators. And these uh, come under the names of resolvins, protectins, maresins, lipoxins. There's a variety of them that were discovered at Harvard to show that in the presence of a M1 pro-inflammatory macrophage, these resolvins or protectins bind to G-protein coupled receptors on the interior of the macrophage cell membrane. And we see the switching to M2 and the macrophage then becomes more benign. It's not pro-inflammatory and it really becomes the cleanup crew. So these specialized pro-resolving lipid mediators, uh, they're biosynthesized in the resolution phase of acute inflammation, and uh, the mediators are potent agonists that control the duration and magnitude of inflammation, and there are four distinct categories, the lipoxins, resolvins, protectins, and maresins. The resolvins and protectins in particular derive from omega-3 fats, so we find that uh, small cold water fish like anchovies and sardines are high in resolvins and protectins, but a lot of that is based on what they eat. So if they're farm raised and fed corn, they're not going to have a lot of resolvin content. But if they feed on plankton and algae and, um, you know, other uh, naturally growing uh, uh, compounds in the ocean, they'll be very high in resolvins. So uh, the idea that resolvins bind to these G-coupled protein receptors on macrophages and dendritic cells are designed to attenuate that inflammatory response. These pro-resolving mediators have certain characteristics. They uh, stop inflammatory cell recruitment. Uh, 
they induce neutrophil apoptosis and clearance. They uh, prevent egress of immune cells, and they have a positive modulation of the immune response, and they induce tissue, tissue repair. They're incredibly important. We're actually beginning to believe that this might be the foundation of why fish oils uh, have been shown in certain outcome studies uh, to be so effective, but also why potentially fish oil studies are mixed. And maybe they're mixed because different fish oils have different amounts of these pro-resolving mediators. And so, you know, there's this growing recognition that uh, maybe the key to a good fish oil uh, beyond the omega-3 and omega-6 content is a relatively high level of these um, active uh, components. So what happens when there's chronic inflammation, though, when things go wrong? Well, we can have persistent innate immune activation. Uh, this forms the basis of a biotoxin illness patient, usually driven by poor antigen presentation. We can also have loss of immune tolerance. So this sort of drives the category of autoimmunity or even cancerous processes. There can be lack of resolution. So patients who are chronically ill for one reason or another typically have low constituent levels of uh, these pro-resolving mediators. So they have a hard time turning off their immune response. And then finally, we can have, in a fancier sense, and we'll, we'll get into this later, dysregulation of, of gene activity. And so this um, idea of lack of regulation of certain genes that control the inflammatory process is part and parcel to a variety of, of chronic conditions. And we'll talk more about what that is. Now, inflammation, the clinician's challenge. So when I think about, if I have a patient who has a disordered immune system, I first ask the question, well, what type is it? Is it a general inflammatory response that's typically linked to cardiometabolic disease, usually because of diet and obesity? Is it due to innate immune activation, meaning a biotoxin patient, or more colloquially a SERS patient, meaning chronic inflammatory response syndrome? Or is it autoimmune? Is it loss of tolerance? And am I dealing more on the T and B cell side? I also think about what part of the immune um, system is, is, is the generator. So where am I? Am I, am I in the innate immune system? Am I in the adaptive immune system or both? Um, I also like to consider what is the original cause. We don't normally think about that in conventional medicine, especially with autoimmune diseases. But I do, especially with innate immune dysfunction, I think about, well, maybe, you know, is the cause still around? And then what can I do to help resolve that inflammation? And what about a dysregulated genomic response? Can I do anything about that too? And the answer is yes, I'll show you what we do to help turn off inflammation at the genomic level. I know that sounds like Star Trek, but it is true. So thank you very much um, for getting through our first lecture. Um, I'll be back soon talking about innate immune dysfunction and biotoxin illness, and we'll even go deeper into that stress immune brain uh, connection.